professor at UC Irvine. Um, one of the things you may not know about Daniel, he's actually made so many visits here to, to us here at UC Davis that uh, the business office uh, made a mistake and, uh, and assigned him an office on the, uh, on the third floor. So we're, uh, we're really glad to have him here at his uh, second home. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to be back. Um, thank you for the invitation and for the after surprise afternoon walk. Um, so today I'll be talking to you about looking for a new physics in the LHC. And I have three projects I've been working on that started from different ideas and different motivations, but have all come together. And I hope that by the end you'll see how these three things be together. First, my major effort in my research program at Irvine is dark matter, the colliders. And I'll talk about a new idea I'm proposing for how to organize experimental searches so we make sure we don't miss anything. And finally, I'll talk about a machine learning application, which I think will be very helpful in conducting this research. Okay, so let's start with dark matter. Now, rather than <clears throat> telling you about what dark matter is and how we know about it from galactic rotation curves, I want to start with a comment on how far we've come in this field. And so, what do we know about dark matter? Well, we know there's a lot of it, right? And if Donald Rumsfeld was to categorize our progress, he might say that we've moved from an unknown unknown, where we didn't even know how little we knew about dark matter, to a known unknown, where at least now we know how little we know about dark matter. Which is an excellent place to be in because it leaves, leaves lots of research opportunities. And we can hope that we'll be here for the transition from known unknown to known known when dark matter is actually discovered. Now, if you're looking to find something and you're really not sure what it is you're looking for, a collider is an excellent place to work because a collider uh, can do real alchemy. We can really turn one kind of matter into another. And the nice thing about the collider is you start from your standard model particles and as long as the new thing you're looking for couples to the standard model, you don't even have to know how it couples, you don't even have to know what it is you're looking for, you can just look. It's an exploration machine because if it couples to the standard model, it will be made in the collider. So you don't have to know exactly what you're looking for, you just have to turn it on and look. It's really for exploration. And as a young guy, a relatively young guy, I can't take credit either for the construction of the LHC or the state of cosmology which led us to this point that we know how little we know about dark matter. But I feel very fortunate to be alive right at the time when we have these interesting questions and these amazing tools which can come together hopefully to answer these questions. And this is actually you, right? Well, this is actually me. <laughs> <laughs> this is the cartoon version of me. Right. But who did this? This is Jorge Chong. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Cartoon version has more hair. This is the simplified model. <laughs> okay, so um, I like to say that we can discover anything in a collider, but we have to make one assumption, which is that the dark matter, if it exists, couples to the standard model, right? And this is an assumption. We don't have data to support this. We know only that, that, that dark matter couples gravitationally, right? We hope that it has some interaction with the standard model, so we can draw this kind of diagram and we say <coughs> our standard model initial state via some unknown blob turns into dark matter pairs. And <clears throat> if this seems like uh, the kind of assumption you make so that the problem is tractable, tractable because otherwise it's intractable, so let's just make that assumption. But we have more basis for that. We, we know because of the relative density that, that um, it's likely that dark matter has some weak level coupling to the standard model. And we remind ourselves that every other dark matter experiment makes equivalent assumptions. So um, making this assumption doesn't single out or weaken the results from the LHC. More of a fond hope? More of a fond hope, yes. All right, so um, if we have the initial state of quark pairs and we have a final state of dark matter, how do we see that at the collider? Because of course dark matter being dark is invisible to our detectors. So the classic strategy is to see this invisible thing recoiling against something visible. And I think that one of the first papers to do this at PP Machine was uh, the CD of Peter Davis. Um, and so classically you would say, well, let's look for a gluon irradiating from the initial state, and then we can see this as a jet in our detector, back to back with something we missed, and so we can see evidence for something invisible by its recoil against something visible. That was the initial idea. And what we've done since then is try to expand on this idea and look in other ways for the same signature. So if you believe that you can see this by gluon radiation, then the same quark can also radiate a photon. Similarly, if you're going down the list of bosons, gluon photon, you might also um, radiate a Z boson or a W boson. And so 
At the Collider, we like to look everywhere, because you never know under which rock there's going to be a surprise. But you can make a pretty powerful argument that for this effective field theory, you notice the theory can be the same. All that's, the only thing that's changed from diagram to diagram is a standard model vertex, right? And the ratio of gluon radiation to photon radiation to Z to W is totally fixed in the standard model, which means you can add these things together coherently to get um, a more restricted limit, right? Because you don't have to make any additional theoretical assumptions to use all this data in conjunction. But it also tells you something you already knew, which is that gluons are radiated much more often than photons. So you expect this to be much more powerful than photons, to be more powerful than Ws and Zs. And in fact, we did this exercise where we took all of these different channels and combined them independently and said, how much does the limit improve? And Here's a result from this paper. Here's the reference for those of you who are interested in. And, it, and the, the y-axis scale here is m star, which is the cutoff scale for this effective field theory model. And this is the mass of the wind. And we have various limits here, but the, the, what you need to know is that the black line here is Atlas plus CMS mono jets, and the blue is when you add everything else to it. So the gain from everything but mono jets is really tiny, which is what you would expect. So that might motivate you to say, well, it's a waste of time to look at the photon channel or the W channel or the Z channel. And that's a strong argument if you are very sure that the dark matter interaction is Q, Q, Chi, Chi. But what if, for example, the dark matter interaction, dark matter prefers to couple to Z's than to quarks? In that case, you can have a process like this where you produce a Z boson, which then goes to Z, Chi, Chi. And Z plus missing energy would be the first channel where you would see dark matter. So it's important not to think too narrowly about the theoretical models we've been given or we've inherited, and to look broadly experimentally because there could always be surprises. So each of these modes could be a discovery mode. In, by, in your plot there, you have Atlas Z. That means Atlas has set a limit on Z Kai Kai? Or? Yes, okay. and I'll talk about it in All right. slides. Atlas equals you. <laughs> you didn't hear that from me. Um, Atlas Z, uh, Atlas Mono Z is, is my view. Okay, so I will talk about Mono W and then Mono Z. Both of these are recent Atlas papers out of my group, and Mono Higgs, which is a Fino paper I worked on with Michael, and which and we're now racing him to, to get an Atlas paper out. Okay, so first, Mono W. All right. <clears throat> so Tim Tate at um, Irvine had this idea last year, now two years ago, which is. If you think about how this would be produced, so this is our Q, Q, Chi, Chi vertex, and here's a radiated W, which decays in his case to a left on a neutrino. He noticed that W's here, um, he noticed that if W's couple differently to up quarks and down quarks, then you get a, a very different limit um, because there's constructive interference. So if, up, if W's couple, sorry, if the, excuse me, if the WIMPs here, couple differently to up quarks and to down quarks, then the cross section blows up this constructive interference, which gives you a large enhancement of the W plus chi chi rate. So if you add one parameter to your model, then in one corner of that parameter space, looking for mono Ws would be even more powerful than mono jet. So the mono jet limits assume that up quarks and down quarks are equivalent when coupling to dark matter. In mono W, you can separate these up quark um, connections versus down quark connections. And if the coupling is different, then mono W would be even stronger than mono J. So this was quite interesting. In the MSSM, is that the case in the, in the neutralino mass mixing matrix? So are they separate up and down? I have no idea, but I'm sure somewhere in Susie's space I'll find a good one. One of you guys? Um, let's see, I mean, if it was. I mean, if they, they would be, they have, if it's a W3, right, then they have opposite, uh, they, you know, it's proportional to hypercharge, they have different hypercharge, so, so I think you might, you know. So the question was, how does this map to the NMSSM? Or the MSSM. It's just, I mean, we know, we, we know, if, if, do you want to, you know, anyway, it doesn't matter, I thought it might be. I would guess how you want, would want hypercharge because the W coupling is proportional to hypercharge. Well, so, o, U, so this is what uh, got us interested. And Tim started from this leptonic it's final state because there was already an analysis that looked at yeah. this. This gives you a lepton plus missing energy. energy. Yeah. It looks just like a W prime yeah, search. Yeah, the so they re they took an existing search and recast it as a search for mono W. Yeah. 
So I'm sorry, I'm just a little confused. So it's not that you have two sort of equal contributions that sort of double your sensitivity. One of them is just blown up by a huge factor so that if the coupling to up quarks is different from the coupling to down quarks, yeah. then there's constructive interference and the total cross-section blows up. In the standard assumption, they have the same coupling. Why does it blow up? I mean, because one of the couplings gets very large. No, no, it's not the magnitude, it's the ratio. Yeah, it's, it's a phase thing. Okay. So which way you want to see which way? You have to read this paper to remind yourself of the details of this, of this C. Um, but C equals one. So th this is the strong. So this is the strong limit here, and this is the existing mono jet limit. So when I make, I mean, this is the dimension. Mind shot, how many again? Opposite. Opposite uh, coupling for up and down. Yeah, opposite coupling gives the largest cross section. I mean, naively, I think you only get a factor of square root of two because the operator has a one over lambda squared, mm -hmm. so the rate is one over lambda to the fourth. But then, if you double the the amplitude, that's quadruple, you know, quadruple the rate. It seems like you should only get a that's factor of no interference. Though. Well, no, I'm talking. I guess let's see. I'm talking about constructive versus. I guess I'm assuming the constructive means a factor of two in the amplitude. Well, I think roughly. you can, I mean, it depends a lot on the distribution in the phase okay. space, right? Well, anyway, okay. Well, okay. Are you able to trigger on those things? <laughs> anyway, you're going to tell us. Yeah, well, so, but the, I mean, this, this signature here is just one high peak, very high peak left onto it. So it's a search for like for a mono, for W prime. 100 jet, 200 jet? 500 jet, or to the W prime search, for example. But we said, let's look for another mode. Um, we have an existing search at Atlas, as everybody does, for a single jet back to back with missing energy. And we said, let's try to use some of our fancy um, new jet clustering tools that can look for a big jet with little jets inside it. Because if this thing W or Z is produced back to back with a lot of missing momentum, it could be highly boosted. And when it decays to two quarks, those two quarks are very close to each other. And it's sometimes hard to distinguish. So what we did was we did a single fat jet clustering and then looked inside that fat jet to see if there were two subjects consistent with those quarks and then asked for the mass of those two subjects to be consistent with a W or a Z. So here we have a fat jet with two subjects back to back with missing energy. And this was work done by Ming Zhao, the postdoc at UCI, and um, he had this idea, he did the analysis, he wrote the paper, he pushed it through, it was one of the first ATV results out from Atlas and uh, resulted in a nice PRL for which he gets 95% of the credit. Um, so you require a single fat jet of about 250 GeV, two subjets inside it, giving um, mass consistent with their W. And the interesting thing is we started out looking for a W, but then we realized we could also see Zs because our, mass, our jet resolution isn't great enough to separate Ws and Zs hydronically, so we get Zs uh, in addition. So are these, just as a question, is this a do-it-yourself ID, or are you using an official Atlas VTAG with trimming and pruning? And yeah, no, we're using an official Atlas um, VTAG. Uh, so, so it probably has pruning language. in there and stuff? Because um, for WTAG, you use pruning. What's your end subjectiveness um, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, we needed that because we needed to sit on top of the Atlas calibration. So you're using their actually. thing, which probably Absolutely. includes pruning. Okay. Yeah, we did not invent our own All right. jet cluster. And then we look, ask for a lot of missing energy, and you look at the mass of the jet, and in purple is what you would expect to see from the signal, so this is um, a signal. So you can see this is for the 350 GV cut, and for the 500 GV missing energy region, so lower and higher. And then this, we would expect a peak here. Um, we can reconstruct a, a single jet as a W, you can see this here. And this is what the background looks like, and of course the data that we use for the background largely there's a little deviation in this one bit, but nothing significant. But it was an interesting set of events. Nobody had looked in this data before for this peak. I'm sorry, I just made this a question. But so that signal, that's, would that be assuming a specific mass <coughs> of signal? This assumes a specific mass of dark matter. So by but, being peaked anywhere, basically. But uh, this is not the dark matter mass, this is the W mass. Sorry, I understand. Right? So remember, we're reconstructing a W going to two jets back to back with missing energy. We can't reconstruct the dark matter mass. So we know, assuming this is a standard model W, we know where to find it. And the Z would sit on top of it. Um, 
So <clears throat> we, we don't see anything. But to me, this is interesting because this is data some, nobody had looked at before. Nobody had taken this data and said, do we see a peak here? And that's always exciting to me. It's interesting to find a new theory to re recast existing data into a new theoretical parameter space, sure. But then you already know you didn't find anything. The thing that excites me is opening the box for the first time and saying, here's data where there could be a peak. Is there one? Of course, the answer is always no, but there's still a So here's an event. And you see this is the missing energy here. And then here is a single fat jet. And inside here, you see there are two subjets, which add up nicely to a W. And this one has, I think, a so What do you end up being dominated by for backgrounds? Is it ZW, or is it, is it intrinsic, or is it something? It's thing? mostly Zs. Mostly Zs. Uh, Z to neutrinos plus j random jets, and then the random jets form a continuum spectrum, and sometimes they fall. So Z percent. jets, not Z W. Dipose on the green is the W Z. I guess. Yeah, sometimes you get W Z, but it's pretty small compared to Z to Z goes to jets. And similarly, W uh, plus jets we have. Right. And you, just just lose, so you don't do electron veto, you just lose it, or you you do. Or you do, you do a veto, but sometimes you sometimes you don't see it. Yeah. And similarly, you could even get Z to two leptons and miss them both. That's a small contribution. And uh, it was a heroic effort to estimate all these backgrounds. All of these are estimated from data using extrapolation regions I don't have time to describe. Okay, and so we set limits. This is a limit on the, the dark matter nucleon cross section of interaction as a function of the dark matter mass. And here we have limits from direct detection experiments. Uh, for example, this is xenon. And you notice, as usual, their limits are weak at very, very low mass and weak at very, very high mass. They tend to be best in the 100 jet region, whereas <coughs> the atlas limits are best at low mass, so we're complementary. And here we have limits for the case when the coupling is the same and when the coupling is opposite. And notice this is analysis of the same data, but the limits are stronger here because the cross-section prediction is much larger in the case when the coupling parameters uh, for the MMD core are opposite. All right. Now, we took this idea, idea and we said, okay, so this is a search for a W back to back with chi's. But I motivated this partially by saying, what if you could be sensitive to other theories of dark matter? So here's a theory where you have chi chi interacting directly with two W's. And this is interesting not just because it makes it a potentially a discovery channel, but because it allows us to talk about other searches. For example, in indirect searches, for example, Fermi and Veritas, they're often looking for this process dark matter annihilation into WW. And if this process exists, and dark matter is annihilating in the galactic core to WW, then we should see this interaction in the collider, right? So we took up the same data and we interpreted in the context of this model, allowing us to set limits on the cutoff scale, again as a function of the dark matter mass, for various forms of the interaction that you assume. And these are just the Lagrangians for various forms. So both for scalar and for fermionic dark matter. And then we can compare the limits we set, so these are our limits, using Atlas Collider data as a function of the dark matter mass, for the size, this is log 10 of dark matter mass, so this is um, 1 GeV and this is a TeV. And this is the, the log 10 of the lambda, so this is again a TeV and this is 1 GeV. These are the Atlas results, and these are the results from indirect detection experiments. So Fermi, Veritas, etc. You see, again, we have the strongest limits at low mass, exceeding um, the limits from indirect detection experiments all the way up to a TeV, which is pretty nice. And, uh, but this, this analysis makes some additional assumptions. For example, we assume that all of the dark matter relic density comes from uh, this, this particle here. And we've overlaid on top of these graphs. This graph and that graph are the same, except that in this case, We've overlaid um, our calculations of what the uh, annihilation cross-section would be for, for Kai Kai or what the thermal relic density would be. Um, so you can use that to guide your sense for the relative probabilities of points in these various spaces. Okay. Does your acceptance plummet to zero at one TV or do you stop looking at that point or what? Uh, what the, happens the acceptance essentially plat the acceptance gets higher at larger, at larger mass and essentially plateaus. The reason this gets weaker is that just because the cross set process, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we, so we, we could extend this further just by doing theory calculations um, to calculate the cross section at higher dark matter mass. We, we don't typically bump up. We just stop. Okay. Right. Right. So that was a nice. Um, 
um, example of taking out this results into the indirect detection plane. Okay, mono Z. <coughs> Next, we moved on to mono Z, and this is done, work done by Andy Nelson, Nelson, another UCI postdoc working on dark matter for me. And um, here we, of course, thought about Z initial state of emission, but then we also looked at these kind of models, Z, Z, Chi, Chi. So I'm just going to, just, sorry, just to be able to slow, can you just go back, go back to one? Just, I mean, isn't it true, though, where, where you're cutting off, your lambda scale is actually lower than your dark matter mass, right? So it's not really clear whether this effective operator thing makes yes. sense. Oh, absolutely. So it's breaking down somewhere, I think, before you actually get there. Yeah, that's true. So the, uh, you always have to take these results with a, um, and, and use your intuition about when these effective field theories break down. They're not valid over the entire space. And the realm of validity is variable as well, as some recent papers have shown. And that's why in the case of mono Z, which came out a few months later, we decided to complement the effective field theories, we would add a, an explicit UV complete model. So here's a simplified model where we don't we, we don't say we're agnostic about the form of the interaction. We specify it and we say that we're going to state our limits in terms of not just the dark matter mass, but also the mass of some mediator. And so this is a mediator we found in a nice paper, which is a, a scalar. And you can have both initial state emission and emission directly from this T-channel mode. And it's just an example. Um, you could also make an example with an S-channel mediator. Um, and so the, res the search here is for two opposite signs, same flavor leptons, consistent with the Z. We veto jets and the third leptons, and we make various cuts to clean up the missing energy to make sure it uh, looks like real missing energy. One of the most powerful cuts was this one, was comparing the PT of the Z to the missing energy, just to make sure the missing energy is not just lined up with the Z. Um, and the dominant background here is real ZZ. So if one Z goes to leptons, the other one goes to neutrinos. It looks just like your signal. The background. The other ones are smaller. Um, and then we have missing energy thresholds at various levels because each of the model points was sensitive at different missing energy spectrum spectra, and so we had four optimization points. And in every case, the data largely agree with the background. We had some low fluctuations. Um, as I <laughs> Only, <had>. in <laughs> <laughs> Only in searches, right? We have high fluctuations for Higgs and low for searches. We paid our, our um, so we'll see the devil for that one. <laughs> Here's what the missing energy spectrum looks like for events with a with a Z and all the other vetoes. You see the there's some contribution here from Z plus jets, but a large missing energy is dominant from ZZ to LL mu nu. And of course, this is the data which largely agrees with the background. And these are some example spectra from various models. Um, this is D1 is one of the effective field theory models for QQ chi chi interaction. <coughs> ZZ Kai Kai looks like this one, and here's the explicit simplified model of the meter meter, just one arbitrary point. So again, we didn't see anything, but you know, we looked what, at data. What people. mass for the mediator in that? What is the mass of the mediator? In this case, it's one TeV, no, but I'll show you. Okay. Uh, we have limits as a function of it. Again, we didn't see anything, but we did get to look at data people hadn't looked at before. So there was a moment of brief excitement, and we go on to set limits for each of these various models, again, as a function of the dark matter mass and for the cutoff scale. These are our simplified models. And one can be concerned about the low values of these lambdas, and that's why it's nice to turn to a simplified <coughs> model. So here we translate them into the spin nucleon cross-sections again um, and compare our results to indirect detection experiments. And then we have limits on uh, on the coupling in this simplified theory versus the dark matter mass and the mass that's being here. And this is the region that we have screwed. So it's, a, it's a, a nice analysis looking for something that might reasonably have been there and then expressing it in a fairly exhaustive set of limits, uh, set of theories. Okay, uh, so continuing down the boson path, to talk about mono Higgs. <coughs> um, Mono Higgs is different from Mono Z and the others because it's essentially impossible to produce it from initial state radiation. Because you know the Higgs covers the mass, and so you know, the, and the coupling to these initial quark legs was, is essentially very, very small. So we focused on theories where the Higgs comes off from a more direct interaction. And so for example, we started off thinking, well, what if we have a scalar wind and we have a simple interaction like this, H H chi chi? 
or you can have a fermion link with similar, similar interactions with or without a gamma 5. And uh, we spent some time trying to build a fairly exhaustive list of operators. And the production modes are interesting. You could have, for example, um, a four-point interaction. Higgs goes to Higgs chi chi. You can have this sort of box diagram with a fermion loop, giving you die Higgs production, where one Higgs is visible and the other one is invisible. Uh, Higgs to couples to chi chi here. Or you could have an intermediate scalar which radiates a Higgs, and a Higgs strong, and then the scalar or the Higgs decays to chi chi. But there's an interesting twist here, which is usually in these dark matter or these theories of new physics, you have a coupling parameter, and you can always just scale up that coupling parameter to give you a larger cross section. So if your if your search is not as sensitive as the theory predicts, you can set a limit on some coupling. We can't do that in this case because for if the dark matter mass is less than half the mass of the Higgs, then the Higgs can decay to dark matter, and we're constrained by observed limits on Higgs invisible decays. And if you crank up, furthermore, if you crank up the coupling here so that this happens more often, then you get more Higgs decays to dark matter, which suppresses the visible Higgs decays. Right? And we, in this search, we're looking for mono Higgs. We're looking for a Higgs. So we need the visible Higgs decays. If you crank up this coupling, then the Higgs invisible branching ratio goes to 99%, and Higgs never decays to the thing you need, and all you get is invisible stuff. In this search, we need a visible Higgs and an invisible Higgs. So we have to balance those two. There are already limits, right? I mean, something like 30%, I forget. There are already limits for invisible, invisible Higgs. Invisible Higgs, decay. Invisible Higgs yeah. from yeah. actually Z plus met. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, the limit is... Just the fact that we've seen it. Uh, less than 70% of them. Okay, and um, then we had various uh, effective field theories where it interacts with a scalar wind or a fermion wind, um, allowing interactions with Zs, for example. And simplified models using a new vector boson with and without Zz prime mixing. Uh, simplified models with a scalar included some interesting, interesting diagrams. Okay. And then we looked at the missing energy you would get from these kinds of signatures. And so these two plots are for one GeV dark matter mass, and these are for one TeV dark matter mass. Uh, this is for some of the effective field theories, and these are the simplified models. And then I don't expect you to be able to read these legends, but we just have the, the different simplified models and effective field theories. And you notice they give a lots of differences in the amount of missing energy. And some of this comes to just the kinematics of producing scalars versus fermions, how much they're back to back. Uh, this kind of stuff sometimes you produce two Higgs back to back and one decays invisibly. And so there's a wide spectrum of predictions from these different models, which is why we try to scan um, a lot of these different model space. So then we talked and we thought about how you could see it at the collider. And we, we did four different channels, but the most sensitive was the two photon channel. Right here, you require two photons in a, in a mass window and then a lot of missing energy. And if you look at the backgrounds you get from two photons, the low missing energy, of course, you just have standard model, standard model gamma gamma production and Higgs to gamma gamma. And those give you fake missing energy. There's no real missing energy here, but sometimes you make a mismeasurement and you end up with a spectrum of measured missing energy. So we cut essentially here to kill most of this fake missing energy and look for our signal, which sits on top of signatures with real missing energy. For example, in the standard model, you have ZH production. Z goes to neutrinos and the Higgs is visible this gives you Higgs plus missing energy. It's a real signature. And that's our dominant background of time missing energy. Sorry, can you, what, sorry, just, what is the, what's the gray that's sticking on top of the green grass on the right? No, 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 no okay, there, that gray. This is Z gamma. Oh, sorry, that's Z gamma. Z gamma. Z gamma. Oh, okay. Z that's neutral. also real missing energy. That's real missing energy. Yeah, sorry. Z neutral. Neutral. Okay, sorry. And we looked at four different channels, uh, gamma gamma, BB, ZZ to four leptons, and ZZ to lepton lepton jet jet. And these are limits, expected limits as a function of dark matter mass. And so this axis here are limits in picobarns. And you notice the black curves, gamma gamma, are strongest in every case. And again, this is for, um, these are for different models. This is the scalar mediator models, different effective field theory models. Each, each pane is a different model as a function of dark matter. But in every case, the diphoton channel is the strongest. The BB is in that cut diagram. 
but then the BG. And the, the, the driving is, reason for, for the Gamma Gamma being the strongest, even though it's got such a small direction? It has smaller background. The same reason why we saw X to Gamma Gamma, we haven't seen it. So it's just an overall sensitivity issue. Mm -hmm. So ZZ is the green one. ZZ to four leptons is the green one. ZZ to two leptons, two jets yeah. is the blue one. Yeah, and ZZ to four leptons is, of course, a tiny branching issue, but then again, the backgrounds are smaller. So in every case, it's a signal in the background issue. Yeah, so how, how is that? <laughs> Are you worried about the missing energy from the tiles themselves? And um, using it? Yeah, that would be tough. I guess that right? makes it harder. All right, so I'm running short on time. So we, um, we plotted these in various, the various parameter spaces. You can look at the paper to see them. Um, let me just summarize. This is the dark matter effort out of my group the last couple of years. We've been doing Atlas papers. So we did uh, 7 TeV photon plus MET. I told you about our mono W to jets. Uh, we worked on Z to leptons plus MET, which is essentially the same paper as the invisible Higgs. Andy Nelson worked on both of these at the same time. Um, and we've also been active in phenomenology. So we wrote the mono Z paper, the dark matter combination paper. This one takes the uh, photon plus MET and tries to compare the LHC results to those predicted by the Fermi line, which is interesting. These are projections of dark matter to the future. I just told you about the Mono Higgs paper, and I told you earlier about the indirect WW paper mapping it to the Fermi lab lines. And uh, what we're working on next are uh, listed here, so we hope those come out in the next. So this was just last month? <laughs> it's about a year and a half of work. Okay, so I told you about dark matter. Let me tell you about topological models, is an idea I had. Okay? And <clears throat> when we're looking for new physics, we have to make a choice with, about how specific we're going to be in our search. And we can either be very, very specific about the model we're looking for, which allows us also to be very specific about how we search for it. If somebody tells you to look for squiggly on the 400 GeV that decay exactly this way, you can look exactly for that, know what you're looking for, and be very sensitive. Or you can say, I'm going to try to look very generally for lots of different kinds of models, <clears throat> forcing you to have a very general search strategy. Right? And so if you bet on a very specific theory and you optimize your analysis to squeeze out the most sensitivity to that new physics, then typically what you end up doing is setting limits in some probably two-dimensional parameter plane where the theory lives in a higher dimensional space and you didn't know what to do with those other ones, so you asked your theory friend, and he told you some useful numbers to just fix those values, right? So you end up excluding <clears throat> part of a two-dimensional slice from an n-dimensional space, which, as you know, has zero volume exclusion. And so you can ask yourself, what have you really learned? If you didn't end up discovering the squiggly on you're looking for, you can't really generalize your lack of discovery to anything uh, important. So that's, that's the downside of betting on a very specific theory. On the other hand, people have gone the very general way, say, Let's be as general as possible. So general that we're going to throw away models entirely and say, let's just compare the data to the standard model backgrounds and look to see if we see anything weird. Right? And this is motivated by a real desire to explore. Let's just go look at the data. And I understand that, but it's, it makes it very difficult because you don't know if what you're seeing is interesting or not without a compelling model. Um, for example, CDF did this in run two. And here's the distribution of the most discrepant histogram they found. Because they didn't know what, they, what to look for, they had to look everywhere for everything. And so this is the angle between jets and bees and events with jet, bees, and positrons. And you see that the, you know, the discrepancy between the, the signal, the, the prediction, and the data is, is there. But you have to ask what this teaches you. To me, it teaches you that you don't really understand uh, jet emissions and QCD very, very well, which is something you already knew. Um, and so if you don't have a model to compare, then you don't know whether what you're seeing is significant because you can't then use that model to make another prediction and test it in another space, right? So my argument is that we need to admit the need for a model. Every result needs to have a model, even if it's simple or trivial. Even if it's as simple as go look for a resonance in two leptons. There you have a simple model, right? It's a heavy particle decaying to two leptons. It allows you to do tests and checks and make predictions of the distributions, etc. So I say, new signal requires a coherent physical explanation, even if it's a very simple one. And so rather than trying to generalize by throwing away the model, I would say generalize by generalizing the model. So let's construct simple models that describe all the classes of new physics that we think could be discovered at the LHC. Okay? 
Okay, so this is a big job, right? How do we make this tractable? So I started to think about, well, what can reasonably discover, be discovered the LHC that we're not looking for? Things with missing energy are being looked for. What else are we good at finding? Well, we're good at seeing resonances. Heavy particle decays to something else that leaves a mass signature over a background. That kind of thing we can see. Okay, so is this being done? Are we carefully looking for all the resonances we could see at the LHC? Well, let's do a little example. I started uh, just by saying, let's take events with two leptons and two jets. So just as an example, <coughs> right? And say, what kind of signature could you get? What kind of resonances could give you this? Well, you could have a W prime, a heavy particle, goes to a W and a Z. The Z goes to two leptons, W goes to two jets. And in fact, this has been done at Atlas and I think also at CMS with the requirement that these two leptons give you a Z and these two jets give you a W. A reasonable requirement for this specific theory, right, because it predicts creation of W and Z, and so you should demand, in fact, that those two, um, those pairs of particles agree with the masses you suspected, right? But what if the W prime likes to decay to two new particles, and these, this isn't a Z and this isn't a W? You've done all the work already to understand the two lepton, two jet final state, you have the data in the background in hand. All you need to do essentially is make a plot to see if there are bumps for other masses, right? But this has not been done. Atlas has this data, the CMS does as well. The data has been analyzed only under the assumption that those two particles are Z or W. The, this theory could be sitting in our data and we just didn't see it because we didn't look for it, right? And to me, this would be a, a terrible disaster that there are discoverable things in our data that we did not find just because we didn't look. Okay? Yeah, so, 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 but uh, aren't there, I mean, sometimes the analysis does change, right? I mean, like, if you're, uh, once you open up some of these cuts, right, you're letting in, uh, you're, you're letting in other backgrounds, right, uh, when you're away from the ZP person. Sure, sure, it can be a little bit extra work. I agree. Oh, right, but you're still saying they'll be a resonant. Yeah, okay. Right. still yeah, be a resonant, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Excuse the same background. Yeah, maybe you're removing yeah. background. Right, right. right. Because right. now there's what is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Okay, so we wrote a paper about this. And in fact, this was a, the final project of a phenomenology class at Tata Verlein, which is fun. And uh, I worked together with uh, Patty Fox at Fermilab. And what we did is we said, let's take this final state, two leptons and two jets, and say, what are all the possible resonances you Yet. Is this intractable? Do you already get 500 possibilities that are impossible to check? The answer is no. There aren't that many possibilities. So you could get, for example, a pair of the leptons and jets. Right? Let's be very open-minded. Well, this is lepto quarks. This is essentially already being done um, in a very general way. That's nice. Here's the example I showed you before. Some new particle decays to leptons, another one decays to jets. And then I said to Patty, well, what about this? What if we have uh, you know, these three guys group into a resonance and this one? And he said, that's ugly, theoretically. I don't, I don't really like that. And I said, I don't really care if it's ugly, because if we find it, then you can worry about whether or not it's ugly. And we've been guided, in my opinion, too often only to look for things which are theoretically elegant or compelling. We need to remind ourselves that as experimentalists, we're there to explore and to find things which are sometimes surprising. We actually have a guy looking for that in CMS. This particular theory? Yeah. Oh, cool. And you can uh, flip this around and say, well, what if this is a, uh, some new heavy quark? which decays to lepton lepton quark. And so we went through and we studied the sensitivity of all those models. And there's one other point I want to make here, which is a sort of a hole in the way we've organized our thinking. Right? For a long time, people use full theories, theories at some very high scale. Right? And these theories are specific theories that are motivated by something specific. So they're not what you would call complete. They don't cover the space of all <laughs> theories. Right? right? But there's still a place for them. And <clears throat> people have sometimes out of the benefits of effective operators, saying, well, we don't need to know the details of the, uh, at a very high scale, so let's just integrate that out as some effective operators. And typically when this is done, there's a lot of effort made to make a complete set of effective operators. I showed you a few of these analyses today, and we went through every possible Lagrangian combination up to some dimension to make sure we covered all the possibilities, right? There's a real effort for completeness. And recently there's this move for simplified models, which are essentially taking a full theory and slicing a piece off, saying, we're not interested in the particle content above some scale, let's just look for the particle content we're sensitive to. But these simplified models are no way complete. It's not a complete set of possible theories that could give you the signature you're looking for. They're motivated by this full theory, right? So there's sort of a hole here. 
where I think topological models fit, which are both at the lower mass scale, so we can handle them, the parameters are electroweak masses, very simple, plus they sort of cover the theory space. Uh, if, you do, if you do this uh, carefully, you should look for every discoverable uh, model, by which I mean every model with an with a obvious resonance, at the LHC. And uh, I can't, I don't understand anybody who can argue that we shouldn't look for all discoverable resonances at the LHC. It seems obvious to me. And <clears throat> so take this idea and say, well, uh, Daniel, you've done a couple of searches at the LHC. For example, you looked for mono W and you demanded that the two jets uh, look like a W. You also looked for mono Z and you demanded these two leptons look like a Z. Too bad you didn't have this idea a year ago, and to which I'd say that's a fair criticism. Um, and so what would you do to this, how would you take these two searches and generalize them, right? What if this process is happening, but this is not a W, it's a W prime? What if this process is actually happening and is in our data, and this is not a Z, but a Z prime? For example, you could have some Z prime, and there's two dark matter states, a heavier one and a lighter one, um, the Z prime couples to both of them, and so you could get this kind of process. And you could cook up other theories which are maybe more or less compelling, but the point is, we have our data, we've looked for Z prime production, we've looked at the dielectron mass in our data to see if there's a heavy resonance, but what if there's a heavy resonance, but it's produced with missing energy? Nobody's made this plot. Just ask for 250 GV of missing energy. Perhaps there's a Z prime sitting in their data just waiting to pop out because we haven't looked at that particular um, spectrum. So this is a paper which should come out in a few weeks. I'm working on with a few people exploring the possibilities for these theories. Okay. Uh, uh, phenomenology. Phenomenological paper, yeah. No new ATV analyses are allowed about this. Really? Right. Yeah. You got a cut off, huh? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> you know, no new ideas, please. Yeah. That's the motto. <laughs> uh, all right, so I told you about our dark matter searches, uh, topological models. Now I want to tell you about a completely different idea, which actually connects back to this one in the end, you see. And it's deep networks. And I'm going to start with a um, perhaps insulting pedagogical approach. I apologize if this seems very basic to you. I just want to make sure we're talking the same language when we talk about these ideas. So these are, this is how I describe our problem to machine learning people at Erlang. I say, how do we look for new physics at the collider? So um, machine learning people don't think about data in terms of a list of variables. They think of it as a list of features. So every collision has a list of features, things you measure of features. So to them, the way we explain our problem is you say, well, we have two theories, right? The standard model and the standard model plus x. And the goal is to find some feature in which these two theories are maximally discrepant, so you can distinguish them. And then you ask nature, by collecting data from the collider, which of these two theories do you prefer? Okay, and so being pessimistic, I gave the example uh, data the agreeing just with the standard model. Okay, and you know, there's, we have real, real life examples of this. Sometimes you really do see things in the data, which is nice. But the situation is rarely this simple, that all of the information you need to discriminate between the two models is contained in a single measurable feature. Often, the new physics is hiding somewhere in a higher dimensional space, one feature, two features, 10 features, right? The kind of things we measure in typical events would be up to 10, 12, 20 measurements. This becomes difficult because what we need to discriminate between these two is calculate the relative likelihood. Calculating the likelihood typically means populating the space with Monte Carlo events. This becomes very expensive as the dimensionality grows. If you say, for example, you need 100 Monte Carlo events, to characterize the shape and the distribution, which I think is pretty conservative, then if you have a d-dimensional space, the number of events you need is 100 to the d, which gets very big very, very quickly. A 10-dimensional space requires an uh, incalculable number of, 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 intractable number of Monte Carlo events. So here's where machine learning helps us. Machine learning says, I'm going to take your high-dimensional problem and boil it down to a one-dimensional problem. Right? Machine learning tools are excellent learning, essentially fitting these shapes in higher dimension and summarizing it in a one-dimensional output. So they solve our essentially computing problem by summarizing the higher dimensional space into a one-dimensional problem when we have no problem um, generating enough Monte Carlo events to calculate the likelihoods in this one-dimensional space. So that's where these neural network tools and machine learning tools have been helpful. Okay, so how does a neural network do this? Well, essentially, you can think so, of a neural sorry, network. Sorry, can I just ask, I mean, yes. if you, to, to know what that, that high-dimensional function is, you only really know it at Monte Carlo. So does that right. really help? 
I mean, there's no, we still have to explore that space to know. We still have to explore that, that high dimensional space with Monte Carlo. Absolutely. If we had the analytic function, we wouldn't have to do yeah, any so functions. We only I'm, had the Monte Carlo, which is hard. And so what we're trying to do here is rather than relying on Monte Carlo approaches, essentially smooth that out, summarize that, extract the so knowledge. So I'm wondering, if, okay, you're going to tell us, I guess, but it's not clear to me that that step of boiling it down is easier than the problem of exploring that, that function with Monte Carlo. Well, exploring the function of Monte Carlo is intractable. I mean, you right. can't generate a So I want to know that, whether this problem is tractable, this boiling down. Oh. Well, it, uh, I mean, it, it, it works. Um, Essentially, the neural network is a functional fit. And it says, I don't know what the analytical function is. I have a bunch of examples from it. I'm going to try to guess what the function from which these examples were drawn is. And you have a very highly flexible function. The way the neural network works is each of these is a sigmoid, and the output is a function of the sum of the weights of the inputs. So you have a very flexible parametric fit, which you then try to fit to that data. And so it's a... Uh, you know, it's not exact. There are approximations there, but it's essentially a summary of the information. And the way it works, you have this structure typically with one hidden layer, and it summarizes it to the output. And the trick is to find the weights, right? Any function is essentially um, a point in a weight space, and you have to search the weight space. And the way we do it is we give examples to the neural network. We say, here's a set of, here's an input vector. You should have gotten this answer. What did you get? Oh, you were pretty far off. So move over in weight space towards the, per the, the correct direction. We'll be using a gradient descent towards the correct direction. And this works pretty well. I guess the, the point is, is that if you wanted to find the absolutely optimal such thing, then you would have to explore the whole space. But here you're just trying to find something that's good enough. So you just explore for a while. And whatever you get is what you use. And then you can just see how well it works. Right, but the optimal function would require an infinite amount of power. Yeah. That's not possible. And so this is, how, how do we do the, the best we can? Yeah, you just see how quickly you get something to see. So. Okay. The problem is that until recently, networks with more than one layer have been very difficult to train. Because the gradients that get pushed back from the output vanish very quickly. So you don't know how to adjust the weights in the intermediate layers. Um, what that means is that the networks are not really covering all the possible functions. It's really just a bunch of linear combinations of the inputs. You can't get highly nonlinear combinations of the inputs with one layer of hidden nodes. And we know that in our problems, we often have very nonlinear combinations of inputs, like the invariant masses of the, of the momenta, um, are critical discriminators. So what that means is that you can't just throw four vectors in your neural network and say, here's my high dimensional space, please figure it out. And anybody who's spent time doing this knows that you have to carefully curate and prune the input vectors to your neural network. Okay. For example, at Atlas, we have this Higgs tau tau search, and they spent a huge amount of time trying to figure out which variables to put into their neural network. And they have variables like angle between the leptons, a ratio of this momentum to that momentum. And you might think, the neural network should be able to figure this out. It's just the ratio to the inputs. But it's not very good at finding these kinds of things. You have to use your brain, your physics knowledge, to say, I'm pretty sure there's some information here, so I'm just going to give you a, a hand here to figure it out so you don't have to search the space yourself. People are afraid to put it, just throw them all in, though. And, and I think it's not a very good reason. Well, yes, yeah, so with a non-linear, with a one-layer neural network, if you give it too many variables, it gets confused also. Uh, that hasn't been our experience. Okay. okay. And this is also true for other MVAs like BDTs and support vector machines. So what about deeper networks? So deep network means one with multiple hidden layers. Okay, until recently, you couldn't train deep networks for the, problem, for the reason I, I said earlier, which is that it's hard to push this information back and train this node. For example. Okay, but now there are new tools, more powerful computers and clever training techniques that let us train these networks. How well do they work? So here's an example of the application of deep networks. You know, one of the biggest AI labs in the world is at Facebook, and one of the problems they have is figuring out when you put your photo, who is that a photo of? They have a photo of you already, but sometimes your face is rotated in the photo. So here, this is a network called Deep Face, which solved the problem of what does Sylvester Stallone look like facing the camera, or what does this person look like facing the camera, given the, 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 our knowledge of these angles. And so they built a neural network to solve this problem. And to me, it's amazing that so many AI resources and bright ideas are focused on problems like this. When we have just for Sylvester Stallone. Just for this. <laughs> they have a different network for every person. 
And so I work together with some guys in the computer science department at Irvine, and um, they have some really powerful networks, and we said, let's see how well your networks work on our problem. So I came up with a benchmark problem, where you have a signal of new physics <clears throat> and a standard model background, and this is just a, a signal that um, we did recently at Atlas. It's actually from a paper uh, from that Marcus and I did a couple of years ago. You have a heavy Higgs, which radiates a W into a charged Higgs, which radiates a W into a light Higgs. So your signature is WWBB. But you know there's a resonance here, and a resonance here, and a resonance here. In the background, which of course is WWBB also from tops, you have different resonances, right? You expect the W and the B to give you a top, and the WB to give you a top, which you don't get here, right? So my question was, can the neural network figure this out by itself? <coughs> so what we did is we said, let's define two kinds of variables. One we call low-level variables, just the raw variables that we get from the detector. So for momentum, right? Jet and left of momentum, missing energy, B tag. And if you look at any one of these variables, right, it's a 21-dimensional space projected in one dimension, you don't see a lot of separation, signal versus background. That's fine. We said, well, let's use our physics insight to give it a boost. Let's say, for it, we're going to calculate these quantities, like the mass of all the objects, the mass of this object, the mass of this object, and we'll, and we'll give it those calculations as another set of variables, we'll call them high-level variables, that contain our physics insight, right? Our intuition about what's going to be good. These are nonlinear combinations. Also PTs? And yeah, and PT. All, this contains all the PTs, and implicitly all the angles, right? Okay, so then we tried it first with standard neural networks. Single layer neural networks from TMBA like anybody would try. And the black curve, so this is signal efficiency, so you want to be on this side, versus background rejection, so you want to be here. So this is ideal performance. So the closer the curve is to this point, the better it does. And it's a curve because we vary the threshold on the output, and we measure the rejection efficiency at every point. So the black curve is what happens when you take a standard neural network and you only give it the low-level variables. And the, the computer scientists like this metric, AUC, area under this curve, bigger, bigger number is better. Okay, so it does all right. But if you give the neural network only the high-level variables, it does better. This makes sense, right, because we've given it some human insight. If you give it all the variables, it does even better. Okay? So what do we conclude from this? We conclude that the, the neural network needs our help. If you just give the low-level variables with no insight, it doesn't do as well as when you share your insight with it, right? Also, the high-level variables don't contain all the information because the combination of low plus high does better. All right, so that just confirms what we thought, and it, it tells us that this is a well-formed problem because it contains, uh, replicates the problem that we see elsewhere. All right, and we also tried this and got similar results from BDTs. What about the deep network? The deep network, again in black, this is how well it does if you only give it the four vectors, 0.88. If you give it the four vectors plus the high-level variables, it doesn't improve its performance at all. So it doesn't need your help, right? It's already figured out what it needs to know, and your high-level variables just replicate what it's already discovered. In fact, if you only give it the high-level variables, it does worse, right? Our high-level variables do not contain all of the useful information. So when you're summarizing it into, into clever variables you think are useful, you may be throwing away important bits. So as a direct comparison, this is the neural network with both the low-level variables and our human-derived um, variables. Right? This is the best case. We push as far as we can with human assistance. This is the deep network without any help at all, just on the four vectors. Okay, so it's a dramatic difference in performance. Trained with back propagation against other. Trained with back propagation. And um, we just trained it longer. We just trained it longer and harder than we used GPUs. We just pushed it really hard. We tried some very fancy techniques, autoencoding, I can tell you about, What's which are really cool. Graphics processing in it. So I thought part of this was uh, matching the uh, output to, to match the input. We tried, so, so there are some very clever that? techniques. Uh, uh, it turns out we didn't even need those. Wow. We just ran longer, pushed harder. But how do you want to push long enough? Long enough? In the deep network? Well, I guess you, you train them all according to the same algorithm. So, or, okay, I get it. So, we, <laughs> the, the computers don't need our help anymore. I mean, these deep networks are smart enough to figure out this problem better than we do, right? 
So to make it very clear, we identify an example benchmark where traditional neural networks do not discover all the discrimination power that's in there. And adding human in insight is critical for the traditional neural networks. But in that same problem, the deep networks not only succeed without human insight, they outperform human-assisted shallow networks. Okay? Now why is that? How do they do it? It's not magic, right? There's some high-dimensional space and they're taking a slice of it. What are they doing? Let's learn from the machines. So this is notoriously difficult to do, to, to reverse engineer a neural network. So what we tried to do is take two examples. So this is the deep network with low-level information versus the shallow network with the high-level information. And we said, what does the sample look like after a background cut that gives you 90% rejection? So equivalent rejection, one network gets a higher signal efficiency. What events is it keeping? How is it getting that higher signal efficiency? Let's try to figure out what it's keeping. So the black is what the signal looks like, pure signal. The red is what the background looks like. And you notice it's a nice peak here. And the purple, this is what the shallow network chooses. Okay, if you say, I want 90% background, it gives you this slice. And you notice it zooms right into this feature that you've given it. It says, I'm going to focus in and gobble up all this stuff here. I'm going to cut very hard in the background, right? It, it's very, it suppresses these background regions, region and focuses on the signal region. The deep network, which remember achieves the same rejection, gets this signal region, but it also digs more into these background dominated regions. So, and remember, I did not tell this deep network that this feature existed. It discovered this feature for itself and made use of it, but wasn't limited to it. It said, I'm going to try to find some juice out in the sidebands also. And remember, this is a one dimensional projection. In some other dimension, it's found a way to separate the signal in the background without being biased by our idea for what might be useful. Okay, so the short answer is that it's, it's found uh, our ideas, but it's also been aggressive in other areas and squeezed out additional performance. So performance is all tested on sets not used in oh, training and all that stuff. Yeah. We tested for overfitting and statistically significant and separate test testing and training samples. So, so how you need God here is deep uh, networks. You only have one deep network or, or there are different uh, deep networks? You start with different initial conditions and different random seeds and you get different deep networks which have equivalent performance. You have an equivalent deep performance. I mean, the final result is a statistical average of several independent deep networks on the same data. I mean, do you worry, uh, I mean, in, in, in practice, for example, and maybe this is not how you do it, but if you train it on Monte Carlo, right, you have to know that all of these correlations, some of which you don't even know what Absolutely. they are, are correctly described by Absolutely. Monte Carlo. Absolutely. Or if you're using a sideband, you have to know that all those correlations, and so you're getting this additional power precisely from these correlations that are not ones that we can think about. So how do we know that we can use this in Great real question. search? Like with any multivariate analysis, you need to rely on your model. It's only, you can only learn the model you've given it, right? But we have good ways these days for checking whether the data, the model is valid. So one thing you can do is plot all the, the variables in one dimension. That doesn't test the correlations. What we do these days is we um, look and we, we compare the data and the um, prediction in the background dominated region. That tells you whether or not the correlations are all modeled. And I guess we're more confident about our modeling of signals and backgrounds usually. So you, you can validate it, I guess, in the background region. And you should always think carefully about how the uncertainties on your model. But you have a model. You have a model. You should use the information that's in it. Um, I guess you could use the, the network that you trained on your to look for your signal on background. Yeah. To test the, the, these correlations exactly. that it's using for the signal. To test that those are described. In background dominated regions, you make sure that the right. output looks like the function. Right. We still can't do these to look for unknown unknowns. No. <laughs> but for example, we wanted but, to ask that, but for example, if you had a large set of models, simplified models, each with resonances in them, and you didn't want to spend a lot of time training neural networks on each one, mm -hmm. and you had a deep network which could automatically find those resonant features and, and yeah. uh, separate them for you, that would be very handy. Which is exactly what I plan to do. Okay, so then we, in the same paper we did a second test case. We said, let's, how, gen how generalizable is this? So here we look for uh, SUSY production. So you have uh, two leptons and a bunch of missing energy. And the background, of course, with two leptons plus missing energy from WW, for example. And we have low-level variables, which already have a lot more discrimination. 
for this particular mass point we chose. And high level variables, we, I scoured the literature for all the clever ideas that people had tried to use to help find Suzy. So you have axial missing energy, you have MT2, you have these razor variables, you have the super razor variables. And we calculated all of them um, as our list of high level variables. And, uh, and here are the results. Again, I sort of skipped over a lot of details, but this is the neural network with our help and the deep network without our help. The deep network just barely outperforms the shallow network with our help. Okay, the margin is smaller um, when you use this metric. But then when you compute a physics metric where we say what would be the discovery potential for a fixed number of input events, you see the deep network is actually really adding a few sigmas to your discovery significance. But even so, say that the two are essentially equivalent. Um, it does outperform the human assisted neural network, but I think what this tells us is something about this physics case. The margin between the deep network and the neural network is smaller because I think there's less to find there. This doesn't have as many useful identifiable resonances. And these high level variables that people spend a lot of time writing papers about are less helpful than they are in the other case. Um, they're essentially equivalent to linear combinations of the input variables, which is why the shallow network can find them almost as well as the deep network. So essentially a test of the case, right? So um, I would say that this, uh, these are all clever ideas from clever people, but perhaps they're equivalent to a simple model. Did you try this comparison with a more obvious uh, case? where there might be more dramatic differences? So the next thing we tried it on, what we're working on now, is Higgs and Tau Tau, All right. for example. So this is something where Atlas and CMS are busy trying to squeeze out the last little uh, sigma out of their data. And so, of course, the signature, the signal is Higgs to Tau Tau, and we did the two left on case versus Z to Tau Tau with equivalent to case. And here's another two left on and missing energy case. Um, and we have high level variables like the missing mass calculator or the visible mass and all sorts of things people thought were useful. And uh, we're still running and we just started this last week. Um, but here you can see the results. This is for just the low level inputs, the human assisted and the combined deep networks and shallow networks. And so you see already the deep networks are outperforming the, um, the shallow networks in terms of the discovery significance. Right? Um, the deep network with just the raw inputs is not yet doing as well as the deep network with our help. So it's, it's going to take a little bit more training. But we just started running this a couple days ago. Are there two, two human assistant, assisted columns equivalent? They're the equivalent set of inputs, yeah. Okay. You yeah, gave them the same amount of help, okay. Yeah. By which I just mean we calculated the... Um, the good variables. The good variables. Right. Daniel, I, I think you mentioned it before. How, how many layers are you using on your deep network? Five. Five. And we tried one, two, three, four, five, and we found it plateaued around four or five. We tried six, and it didn't work. So what about this universal approximation theorem? Do you know about this? Yeah, so um, it's often stated that a neural network, a one-layer neural network, can approximate any function. To any desired. And that's true with an arbitrary number of hidden nodes. So a wide number. A very wide Broad number. Enough. Okay. And typically what people do is just use 2n plus 1 when n is the number of inputs. So we tried this. We said, let's take a shallow network with the same number of nodes as our deep hidden network. Yeah. It doesn't work nearly as well. You can do that, but you take many, many more nodes in a shallow network than you would in a deep network because you don't get the combinations of features. You don't get those nonlinear features very easily in a shallow network. You need to compound the sigmoids several times to approximate the amount of the network is less complex. The network is much less complex if it's deep than if it's shallow but wide. So I was going to say those are right. the connectivity is, is it much. Okay. Sorry, yes. The con there's more connections. Yeah. So you need fewer nodes to solve the same problem with deep network than you do with shallow network. What about in terms of like the time you spend training? Great question. So the deep network takes longer. But if you consider all the possible shallow networks you've tried, for example, then it, it's faster. I mean, for example, these, in this Atlas study, they spent two months trying different neural networks. Each one only took three or four hours to train. They could have equally spent two days training a deep network in the end save time. <coughs> and you parallelized the training somehow on GPUs? You used GPUs to, to boost the, the speed a little bit. But you could equivalently just do use normal CPUs. What about the size of the Monte Carlo samples? Is this a problem for uh, for when people want to use full Monte Carlo, or is the idea that you would train these on on parameterized Monte Carlo and then? I think you could train.
train on fast, but we used um, I used a million a million data points for each one, which I don't think is that feasible. But these are so. But these were with parameter like Delphi's. Uh, this is all public. Like, yes, yeah, uh, so. yeah, um, You mentioned a little bit briefly, but I'm not sure if I followed. Like, no, in the uh, you talked a lot about the training, but what about the testing part? So when you have uh, a separate Monte Carlo sample to test, like, what the results of the whether you have the same results of your neural network, how how different are those? And, and like the for example here, like if you have a discovery significance. You trained your sample. You got the most significance for a particular network. Now you have a testing sample. Do you get the same number? How how different are those? All the results we quote are from testing samples. Okay. From samples that are independent from those trained on, and we always check that the performance of training and testing is equivalent, roughly equivalent, to demonstrate that we didn't overfit. I mean, so roughly equivalent, like how to give a feeling how how to within statistical significance. Okay. I mean, you don't train beyond the point where you're overfitting because it's not helpful. So that's where you decide when to when to finish training. Exactly. Okay. Have you have you thought about trying to use this for a jet substructure? Is this an area where there are a ton of explosion of different variables like top tagging and all this kind of stuff? I have thought of that, and one thing that stops me from working on that um, immediately is that it's an area where uh, we, we have a special um, skepticism about the effectiveness of all models. So you might find yeah. a deep network which squeezes out a lot of juice from your data, but you really don't know how well we trust these models um, to understand the fragmentation, the fragmentation yeah, and the showering. Yeah. And, you know, you're really learning Pythia versus Herbig, or you're learning yeah. QCD versus Ws. So I have a related question. Uh, I think it's oh. a good possibility, but we need to make sure we really know how the models are useful before we try to learn them. Uh, so is my memory wrong, or weren't you out here uh, like a year and a half ago telling us that jet substructure was a waste of time and we should just cut out <laughs> on low delta R? Part of this disinformation. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, in that case, we, we found an example where it's it effective. But I mean, if you if you if you train something on uh, on on Monte Carlo, some jet substructure thing, and you validated it on data and it worked, mm -hmm. what would you say? No, well, absolutely, yeah. And there are also, you know, there are, there are learning methods that don't require um, Monte Carlo. Things like unsupervised learning you can train just from the data itself. That can be very effective. You could train it on solid training on side bands if you're going to find side bands. And I happen to know uh, Toby Golding of Yale is working on this right now. Anyone anyway, trying genetic algorithms? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, so. Um, I talked about a, our broad-based attack on all the LHC signals for dark matter, which are trying to cover all our bases. Um, I argued that we should organize our experiment to searches in a way that we completely look for all discoverable resonances to uh, avoid having obvious stones be in turn. And uh, I talked about application of deep networks to high physics. Thank you very much. So, for example, suppose right, you had you had two and a half. You know, if you did a straight human, you know, human understandable analysis, you got I don't know two point something sigma. But then when you boosted it with this stuff, you don't know what it is, and it pushes it up, pushes it up to three point five sigma or four sigma or something. Just some whatever is reasonable. So you now you, you really care about the extra juice, but you don't really understand as a human being where it came from. It's possible to to probe it as we've done to see what it's using to discriminate. And remember, neural networks are just functions. And it's just a you know, function on the real numbers to one output. Those can be understood. The thing that surprises me, actually, is how many papers are written now with neural networks where we do not quote the function. So we've used a neural network, and we don't, don't specify what it is. It's equivalent to saying, there is a magic variable we are calculating and not telling you about and putting a cutoff. 
It's, yeah, uh, to me, it's shocking yeah. that they published. There should be a way to publish. It's not it. reproducible. It's not even a description of what the people Is have. there a standard format for these functions? I mean, just like there are standard formats for plots, right, and root and whatever. Is there a standard format even existing for well, this? There is. You know, TMBA has some format internally for storing um, the connections and the nodes and the weights. Just saying that might be the first step, is just to define a, a protocol that everybody agrees this is the way you specify it. All right, we've gone quite a bit over. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Yeah,